Question four, part A. Let's go immediately to the required and see exactly what is needed. Part A says, calculate the employee's tax that was withheld from Albertina's remuneration, excluding the Provident Fund lump sum for the month of February 2014. This is very important. Remember, we ask specifically, we say calculate, so we know already it's a calculation question. We ask you to calculate the employee's tax, so you know that you're dealing with employee's tax, that was withheld from Albertina's remuneration, and then we say excluding the Provident Fund lump sum. So we know that this calculation should not include the Provident Fund lump sum, and we tell you that it's for the month of February 2014. Okay, part B says, calculate the tax payable on Albertina's lump sum receipt for two marks. So we know that we're dealing separately with that. Okay, let's start reading the question. Albertina retired on 28 of February 2014. She was 65 years old and married, and sorry, and unmarried. Up to her date of retirement, she had worked continuously as a bookkeeper for the same employer for the past 18 years. Remuneration and expenses. The only remuneration that Albertina received, okay, so we can actually go straight into the question and start answering it. We remember the two columns. We've always told you to please lay out your answer so that it's easier for markers to mark and for you to also follow through. Okay, so we're busy with question four. We have your working column and we have your final column. Okay, so we're doing part A, which says for 10 marks. Remember, this is for 10 marks and we say please calculate the employee's tax. Now, in order for you to answer this question on employee's tax, firstly, you would have to know the theory on employee's tax. And having said that, you would have to know what is included in remuneration or net remuneration. If you don't know the study unit or you haven't gone through the chapter on employee's tax, I suggest that you do so right away because it will be difficult for you to answer this question. You have to understand the theory before you do the application of this uh, section on employee's tax. But let's continue. So it says that Albertina received for the month of February 2014 a salary of 16,000 Rand and a gold watch. So now we know that in calculating employees' tax, we've got to work out remuneration. Okay, and her remuneration. There is an alternative when you're doing employees' tax. There are two ways of doing it. You either do it annually or you can do it on a monthly basis. Okay, so we will, I will show you both. So we're doing an annual amount and a monthly amount. Okay, let's move the remuneration down. Sorry, one down. Let's go to remuneration. Okay, so she gets 16,000 Rand a month. Where did I get the 16,000 Rand a month? From your question, it told you that she got for February 16,000 Rand. So annually, what would she get? If you take 16,000 Rand for one month times 12, annually means 12 months. So then we get 192,000. Okay, and a gold watch, which she received as a long service award. The market value of the watch was 9,500 and it cost the employer 8,900. Albertina contributed 1,800 per month to a provident fund. Immediately you see that there's a long service award. If you know the rules of employees tax, you would know immediately that a long service award is a once-off, um, it's a once-off award it's an annual amount, it doesn't come into your, into your remuneration. So we hold on to that. We go on to the uh, contribution to the Provident Fund. So we say Provident Fund deduction. Remember we included all her income, now we're doing her deduction. And as a rule, we know that Provident Fund deductions are not allowed. So then it will be no for monthly and no for annually. Are we happy? Okay, are there any more expenses that I haven't gone through here? No. Uh, so I've covered her remuneration. Yes, I've covered her salary. I'm happy with that. The gold watch, we said we're going to hold on to that. And I've covered her um, contribution to the Provident Fund. Good. So I'm happy to go. Let's go. Okay, so under annual, I will still have 192,000. Under monthly, I will still have 16,000 Rand. Okay, let's move on. So we say, okay. Now we're at a point where we have an annual amount and we have a monthly amount. We need to calculate employee's tax. In order for us to calculate employee's tax, that is the tax that, as an employee, you will pay over every month. 
you need to um, calculate what is an annual equivalent. Remember, those of you that have answered on an annual basis, when I did annual and monthly, it's either or. You cannot answer this question both on annual and monthly. Those of you that have answered annually, you will have 192 already as an annual equivalent, okay? Those students that have answered on a monthly basis, you will have 16,000 rand year in your final column. So to get to an annual equivalent, you will have to take 16,000 rand times 12 months and also then get to the 192,000. So at this point, all students who have answered either on the annual basis or the monthly basis will have exactly the same answer. Okay, let's go on. What do we do from, we, from here now? We have an annual equivalent. We need to calculate employees' tax. We need to determine what is the normal tax as per the tax table. Okay, how do we do this? You have an annual equivalent. I'm sorry, you have yeah, an annual equi equivalent of 192,000. We need to calculate what is the normal tax. How do we calculate the normal tax? Students, it's basically using your tax tables for individuals for 2014. Remember that please by now you need to know how to use these tax tables. It cannot be the first time that you see this in an exam or uh, apply this in an exam. Okay. So if I go to my tax tables and you, you know how to use a tax table, so if you take a taxable income of 192,000, apply to your tax rates for individuals for 2014, you will get a normal tax per table of 36,408. Please go and work this out. Go and do the calculation to make sure that you get to 36,408. Less your rebate. Remember, an individual, Albertina is an individual. How old was Albertina? 65 years old, very important. Age is important because it depends um, on what rebate she's gonna get. So someone who's 65 years old, for the 2014 year of assessment, she gets a rebate of 18,830. Okay, so if you take that out, we're sitting with 17,578, and that is her employee's tax for the year. Remember, we're still working on an annual amount of that 192 because your tax table is annually, your rebate is annual. Employee's tax for the year, excluding the long service award. Okay, remember we spoke about that long service award at the beginning? This amount doesn't include the long service award. So at this point, we have an employee's tax for the entire year of 17,578 for the year. We asked you in the question, go back to part A and read. We said, what is her employee's tax for the month of February? So if we're dealing with a month, we say for the month, it's going to be 17,578 divided by 12 months. So it's 1,465 at the moment. Okay, so this is her employee's tax based on her salary, excluding the long service award, 1,465 rand. This is only a section of the answer. Let's move on, I'm gonna go on to a new page. Let's draw our columns again. Now we can say, okay, so I've dealt with the remuneration, I've dealt with the provident fund. Now I can say, okay, what is my annual equivalent hundred and ninety two. I now to, I now need to bring in this long service award that I've been speaking about. Okay. Long service award, cost to employer is 8,900 Rand. Where did I get that from? If you go back to your question, it says, Albertina got a gold watch, received um, as a long service award. The cost to the employer was 8,900 Rand. So although 
Although the market value of the watch was 9.5, the cost was 8,900 Rand. As a rule, we always use the cost to the employer, 8,900 Rand. Remember that when you get a long service award, there is um, an exclusion. You get an exclusion for long service. Up to 5,000 Rand is excluded. It's not taxable. So then, what is taxable? 8.9. Minus 5,000, 3,900 Rand. So now you are adding this long service award to your annual equivalent, and you're going to calculate employees' tax on this long service award separately. So you've done remuneration separately, you're doing your annual, um, uh, your long service award separately. Okay, so let's take this. So what is 192 plus 39? 195, 900. And it's exactly the same step as we did in the part above. Um, without the long service award, you take your normal tax as per table. This time it is based on 195,900. Your normal tax would be 37,383. Remember, I use the tax tables again, applicable to individuals for the 2014 year of assessment. We say less the rebate of 18, a 30. Remember, Albertina is 65 years old, so 37, 383 minus 18, 830 gives me 18,553. Okay, you need to please understand this concept. It's very, very important. We had, in the part above, employees tax for the year. If I go back to this paper here, I'm going to bring it through. We had, for the year 17, 578, excluding the long service award. Remember that, okay? Now I've given you, so I'm gonna highlight the 17, 758, remember this amount. Now I have employees tax for the year. So I have employees tax for the year 18, double five, three. So let's take the difference between the two. 18, double five, three, minus 17, five, seven, eight. That gives me 18, double five, three, minus 17, five, seven, eight. Gives me 975 Rand. And this 975 Rand is the employee's tax on the long service award. Okay, it's the difference between what we calculated and the employee's tax for the year on remuneration less the employee's tax including um, the long service award is 975. To this 975, I then add the employee's tax per month from the part above which was 1,465. It was the, the employee's tax that I calculated excluding the long service award because I'm trying to get to a total employee's tax for the month of February 2014. I've asked you to split the employee's tax for on remuneration and then you do it separately on the long service award. So that's the long service award. We add that part above and then the total employee's tax is 1,465 plus the 975 which is 2440. And that would give you total employees tax for February 2014. And my answer would then be 2440. And that is part A of your question being answered. Let me just look quickly again through with, um, you know, with it with you to see that we've answered everything. It says calculate employee's tax. Have I done that? Yes, I have. That was withheld from Al Albertina's remuneration, excluding the Provident Fund lump sum. Yes, I haven't even read the lump sum received um, portion for the month of February. Yes, I have. I've done it separately. I've, I've excluded the, the long service award. I've done that separately. I've done the employee's tax on the remuneration. I've added the two up and I've got a total, um, total employee's tax for February. Okay, let's move on to part B, little part B, which is for two marks. I'm going to move on to a new page for you. Okay, part B says, still on the same question, K 
calculate the tax payable. Immediately when you see this, they're asking you to calculate, they're asking you to do tax payable, and they're asking you to do it on the lump sum receipt. There's your lump sum receipt. So on top they said exclude it, now we're saying please calculate what is the tax payable on this lump sum receipt. We say on the date of her retirement, very, very important, we're telling you Albertina has retired. It should bring up red flags. Albertina received a provident fund lump sum amounting to 780,000. Her total contributions to the provident fund over the 18 year period of employment amounted to 350,000. We are asking you for two marks to calculate the tax payable. How do we go about calculating tax payable? So we're still on question four and we're on part B and we're saying, okay, please calculate, calculate tax payable. Okay, what was the lump sum that Albertina received? Albertina received a lump sum of, let's draw a column, let's draw two, 780,000. So she got 780,000 rand, and we say less allowable deductions. What was she allowed to deduct? Tells me in the, in the question it was 350,000. So 780 minus 350 gives me 430. Okay, so this is now my taxable portion. My taxable portion is 430,000 of this lump sum received. What is my tax payable? Tax payable on this lump sum. Okay, this is very important students. Remember that uh, it's important as to which table you're gonna use. When you're doing individual's tax, you go to the individual's tax table, however, this scenario is different. We have specifically said it's a retirement, so you need to know that there's different tables for different scenarios. You cannot use the normal tax tables for individuals that we do in a normal taxable income framework. This table is the retirement lump sum table. It's the table that we use when we, re when we, when we retire. Please, you cannot see this table or try to attempt to use this table for the first time in your examination. You will hit a brick wall. Please go and attempt this. Okay, so tax table on this lump sum, taxable portion, 430,000 minus, if you use the tax tables that I've spoken about, let's go to it. So I'm going to go through um, this one with you very, very slowly and, you know, walk through with this table. Let me just find it for you. So you get the individual tax tables, and then you get the retirement, um, you get the retirement table, and then you get the withdrawal table. So we are busy with the retirement table. So if you take a taxable income of 430,000, it falls in this bracket, 315,000, and it's at 18%. So I've actually used the table, the retirement fund lump sum benefit table, okay? And I would get a taxable, um, tax payable of 20,700. So if you use your calculator, it's 430,000 minus 315,000 times 18%, 20,700. And that is answering the question, because the question said calculate the tax payable. And that would be the tax payable on Albertina's lump sum benefit receipt, which is 780,000. If you do not use the correct table, you will not get awarded the mark. Okay, so please be very careful about that. And that answers question B of um, part A of question four for two marks. Okay, we're gonna move on to part B now. Move on to a new page for you. Okay, so we're still on question four and now we're going to part B. Part B, the required says, briefly discussed. Okay, so we're saying briefly discuss. So immediately when we read this, we know it's a discussion question. We're asking you to briefly discuss, so we know there's, okay, some kind of um, theory coming in. Briefly discuss in terms of the gross income definition, whether or not, so we're saying in terms of the gross income definition, whether or not Victor's compensation will be included in his gross income. 
Listing the requirements of the gross income definition is not required. Okay. So this question has specifically said, discuss in terms of the gross income definition whether Richter's compensation will be included in your gross income, but do not list the requirements of the gross income. This is a theory question, students. And theory questions are basically knowing the theory, understanding the theory, and applying the theory to the scenario that we have given you. Okay, so let's read the scenario. Victor, a mining geologist, was seriously injured in a motor vehicle accident during the 2014 year of assessment. As a result, he was not able to work again, and he became entitled to receive compensation from the Motor Vehicle Assurance Fund for loss of future earnings. Victor had the option of either receiving the compensation in a large once-off payment or alternatively in the form of smaller monthly payments for the rest of his life. Victor elected to receive the compensation in monthly payments. He received the first monthly payments in January 2014. And we say again, briefly discuss whether this compensation will be included in his gross income. So should it be part of Victor's gross income or should it not be? part of Victor's gross income. This question was based around a court case on page 67 of your textbook. It was Commissioner versus Hogan. Please go and read that case right now. Um, it was based around um, the same principles of that case. So I suggest that once you read that court case, you will gain more insight and understanding on how to um, apply the theory that you've learned to this question. Remember, this is a gross income question. So you would have to understand and know, even though we have asked you not to list the requirements of the gross income in point four, we need you to understand and know the theory behind what is gross income? What does gross income mean? Should it be included in Victor's um, gross income or should it not? You would first have to understand that theory of what is actually gross income before you can answer this question, and that is imperative, okay? So let's look at how we're going to answer this. It's basically a theory question. The solution is in front of you, and I'm not going to be rewriting it with you, so we will just, I will just read this with you. So the starting point for establishing whether the taxpayer's receipt, which is Victor, obviously, will be included in his gross income is to determine whether what they would be regarded as annuities. Remember, Victor is given an option now to receive it, to receive it is either as a lump sum or in monthly payments, and Victor has elected to receive the compensation in monthly payments, which means if you receive something every month, it's an annuity, we know that. Case law, which is, I told you, Commissioner versus Hogan, go to that, page 67, has identified the following characteristics of an annuity. Okay, so you also have to know what are the characteristics of an annuity. An annuity provides for a fixed annual payment even if it is divided into installments. It's repetitive, uh, repetitive, repetition, year to year. It's chargeable against the same person. The compensation is periodical. The taxpayer has a right to receive more than one such payment. The monthly payments can therefore be regarded as annuities. Accepting payment in the form of annuities means capital status of amount is lost. Furthermore, Annuities are specifically included. Now, this is where you need to know what are the specific inclusion in terms of the gross income definition. So, like I've said before, understanding the theory is imperative in order to answer these ki kind of questions. And this is with any, ki um, any, any scenario we throw you, be it gross income, be it general deduction formula, be it a capital gains tax question, any theory question, you would have to understand the theory before you're able to apply to a scenario. Okay, let's go on. So annuities are specifically included in the gross income definition. The compensation complies with all the requirements of definition of gross income. Therefore, Victor, who receives these payments on a month-to-month -month basis, these amounts will be included in his gross income. It will be included in his gross income based on this argument above that I've just discussed. You need, to lay, you need to lay out your answer as such. You need to substantiate to the markers, why am I getting to this conclusion? How am I getting to this conclusion? Okay. If the taxpayer 
Now we say, okay, we're giving you a different um, an option or a different scenario. If the taxpayer had elected, so if Victor had said no, I'd rather have the compensation as a once-off payment and not as monthly installments. The receipt would have retained its capital status and would have been tax-free. Do you understand what I've just said? So if Victor had said no, I don't want the annuity on a month-to-month -month basis. I want it as a once-off uh, once lump sum payment. This payment that Victor received, it would not have been included in his gross income. It would have been tax-free, not included in his final column, out. But because Victor elected to receive this compensation on a month-to-month -month basis, based on the argument and based on the fact that it's an annuity, it's regarded as an annuity, it fit the criteria of an annuity, it is therefore included in his gross income. And that was, students, for a full five marks. Only if you know the theory, you can put down the theory, you can substantiate to me, you can apply it to the scenario, and then you will be able to answer the question.